you're going to watch a very very special edition of Mi Yo Futuro, My Future Self. It is a conversation with none other than Professor Richard Thaler, our great reference in behavioral economics, Nobel laureate in economics. This conversation was recorded at the Congress of Longevity Economics organized by CENIE in the wonderful setting of the city of Salamanca. I would like to thank CENIE for their kindness in allowing us to use the images of the event and, of course, Professor Richard Thaler for participating in it. So then, enjoy Professor Thaler. We will start this afternoon session by having a chat with Professor Richard Thaler. For me and for all of us uh, who work in behavioral economics, pensions or finance, uh, he is in fact our inspiration. Uh, when we have a doubt or are not sure about something, we always refer to Thaler. Uh, his articles, his books, his talks are a Bible for all behavioralists. So Richard, welcome to Spain. I hope you are enjoying your visit to our country and today in this beautiful city of Salamanca, uh, home to a university uh, that is 800 years old. Uh, I, I think, by the way, you have already visited um, um, and is one of all the oldest in, in Europe. Thank you very much for being with us today. It's a pleasure. I'm enjoying my time in Spain. Great. And in Salamanca. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Professor Thaler was awarded, as always, uh, as, as all you know, the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2017. And he's one of the most recognized, along with Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, as the father of behavioral economics. He's gifted at getting his ideas across simply. Uh, you only have to listen to his speech at the Nobel Prize banquet, or here's cameo in the movie The Big Short, where he and Selena Gomez explain the disastrous CDOs. Uh, well, Richard, your contributions to economics and society from a behavioral perspective have been and continue to be crucial. In your brilliant speech at the Nobel Toast, you said, I discover the presence of human life in a place not far, far away where my fellow economists thought it did not exist, the economy. How did you discover it? <laughs> uh, well, I did what many economists don't seem to do, is I looked out the window <laughs> and uh, noticed uh, what people are doing. And, uh, you know, the, the, the people, well, there really aren't people in economic models. As you know, there are agents. They don't even call them people. And these agents are uh, very peculiar creatures, very, very smart, uh, you know, uh, like Deep Blue, the, you know, computer chess player. Yeah but unemotional, uh, have no self-control problems, uh, completely selfish. I mean, they're just a, uh, they'd be a very weird character to meet. There are a few economists who, <laughs> who approximate them, but so, you know, I, I thought maybe uh, we could get somewhere further along in economics by, uh, opening it up to some real people. Well, here we are holding a Congress on longevity and one of the first questions we can ask ourselves is what is longevity and what are its causes? It seems that science proves that not more than 25% of our life expectancy is genetic. The rest is related to our lifestyle, nutrition, prosperity, in short, behavior. You yourself uh, have said that aging 
like other major challenges that humanity is facing, is intrinsically a behavioral issue. Nowadays, science is close to achieving positive shocks to life expectancy. What consequences do you think this could have? Well, you know, we've just been living through one such shock, uh, the COVID. Uh, actually, a pretty minor shock uh, to life expectancy in the grand scheme of things, but obviously a huge shock to the economy. And it can give us a, a glimpse of the profound effects health can have on the economy. And what, what we've been talking about so far today is that uh, as people grow older and remain somewhat functional, uh, my wife says I'm somewhat functional, um, uh, you know, as we remain somewhat functional for longer and longer, it creates a problem. Uh, as you know, I've spent uh, a lot of time trying to study the problem of helping people prepare for retirement by saving up some money. The, the problem at the back end, the so-called decumulation problem, we've been helping people accumulate, the decumulation problem is much harder, much harder conceptually. Uh, uh, you have to, you know, suppose you retire at 68 and you have a life expectancy of 21.3 mm -hmm. uh, and you have a pot of money. Now we say, okay, <laughs> go, go have fun, make it last. And uh, you know, I don't know a single economist who thinks they would know how to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's just one aspect of uh, mm -hmm. the, the problems we face as a society of uh, having more and more, mm -hmm. well, we used to call them elderly, but mm -hmm. uh, mature. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you think we have enough tools for this process of accumulation? Tools and knowledge? No. We have, well, we have, we have one tool, which is the annuity. Yeah. And there's a, a, a puzzle about annuities, which is people who have them, like an old-style pension plan or a social security plan, they love them. They fight. They won't want to give it up. But people who accumulate a pot of money essentially never buy annuities. Hmm. I, I was involved, I was brought in oddly to, to a labor dispute with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, one of the greatest symphonies in the world. And there, there was a strike. And the strike was because the orchestra wanted to switch from a defined contribution plan to a defined benefit plan. Mm -hmm. And they offered the members of the orchestra what I thought was something better. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a defined contribution plan with some bells and whistles and guarantees. Yeah. And so, so but they were on strike for months and the existence of the orchestra was hanging in the balance. So somebody called me and said, would I talk to somebody? And I talked to a couple people in the orchestra who were influential. And I said, look, you guys are fighting for something that you wouldn't choose to buy if you had the option. You know, you, what, what are you doing? Yeah. And um, so 
I, we have that one tool that people don't want to give up but aren't willing to buy, and we have essentially nothing else. <laughs> Uh, you know, wealthy people hire financial advisors yeah. to help them. There are some rules of thumb, like you can spend 4% of your wealth each year. Th that, it's not clear how you would actually apply that rule, and it probably isn't very good advice. But, um, but otherwise, no, we... We're starting at zero. Absolutely. And if, if you think about it, this is, you know, it took us a, a century or so to figure out how to do better on the accumulation. Mm -hmm. And before the 20th century, humans didn't have to deal with this problem. Yeah. They conveniently died. And the few that lasted until something like my age, their children or extended family would take them in. Um, so it's a new problem. Much, you know, uh, this university is much older <laughs> than, than the retirement saving problem. So we're not very good at solving it and the decumulation part is particularly thorny. Yeah. I mean, effect and above all, the amazing concept of Natch. So Richard, which area do you most like to work and research in? You know, I, I only work on things that I find are fun. I mean, that, which sounds funny, but no, it's true. It's true. Um, you know, my, Supposed best friend, Danny Kahneman, who I've been friends with for 45 years, claims that my best feature is that I'm lazy. <laughs> now, I don't deny being lazy, but I say, really, is it my best feature? You know, but he, he insists that it's a compliment. <laughs> because being lazy, I'm only willing to work on important things. I don't think that's really true. I, I work on some things that are probably not that important, like sports and things like that. But if it's what keeps my brain going, that's what I like to do. And I must say the financial markets, the last few years have become quite funny. Yeah. Yeah. And so that we are going to talk about that. That's, you know, that, yeah, that's, because it yeah. is, it is. It's very funny. Yeah. yeah. I mean, probably not so much if you're in the, in that business, but as just, you know. Okay. Uh, probably the, the fundamental drivers, the big trends looming in our present are the fourth industrial revolution, climate change and demographic evolution. As we know, behavioral issues arise in all of them. Uh, do you think we have any real ability to shape our own future? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, but, you know, what we've learned is you can't just tell people what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we, we can't say, go have more kids. Uh, you know... That's a decision that uh, parents or potential parents make, and the government can say, you know, it would really help if you had more kids, but that's not really going to do it. Uh, we can tell people, look, you know, you might live to 100. Maybe you should take care of your body a little bit more, mm -hmm. uh, but that requires self-control and discipline. And mm -hmm. so there's... There's no doubt that the things that Andrew and Nick were talking about this morning uh, are going to change the, the world in the next 20 to 50 years as climate change. I mean, I think the problems are in some ways similar. We see a slow moving threat. And at its heart, both 
are behavioral problems. If we're going to deal with climate change, we have to consume less carbon. Uh, and we have to figure out how we're going to do it. Um, and with this, uh, people are going to have to prepare for living longer by financially and otherwise. Uh, and we're going to have to create institutions to help them. Mm -hmm. And but it's all it all comes down to to behavior. And of course, government has an important role. But you, as you know, my mantra is uh, if you want to help people make it easy. And that's it's easier to say than to do. So what what things can government do to encourage the development of the right institutions, the right financial instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are many things that that uh, governments and the private sector people, if people can invent new alternatives to annuities, that people will find more appealing, but will help them spread out uh, a pot of wealth over their lifetime then, uh, yeah, there's room for intervention and help at every level. Good. Um, as, as you have uh, mentioned, Andrew Scott explained us this morning that the increase in longevity has multiple economic and social implications. One of them is the end of the life uh, in three stages. What do you think about that? Well, I think, yeah, I think he has a very good point that uh, the... The idea that you work until you're 65 and then you retire is an obsolete idea. Hmm. And uh, first of all, where did 65 come from? It's, it's not in the Bible, as far as I know. <laughs> um, it's not. It's not in the law. It's a number. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think as we saw in one of the charts, countries are gradually adopting mm -hmm. and altering the, like their social security systems, but it's a moving target. And, you know, I mentioned COVID is an example of a, of a health related shock. Uh, people in the insurance industry, uh, and certain ministers uh, can be worried about the, an opposite shock. Yeah. So suppose medicine finds a cure for cancer yeah. or heart disease or, or a way of treating diabetes that doesn't involve patients following a strict regimen. I think on that one, the technology is very close. Uh, well, any of those things could just suddenly increase life expectancy by a year or two. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you're in the annuity business, that's a big problem. For sure. so, and if you're in the social security provision business, uh, as many governments, most governments are, mm -hmm. that's a big problem. Yeah. So... Um, you know, if we can have a few pandemics to offset, that could help. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there, there are there are many unknowables, and uh, we're we're going to we're going to have to be resilient. I think maybe that was the biggest lesson we should take away from from COVID is our lack of resilience. Yeah. The uh, we we were just. Uh, there was no country really that was prepared to deal with this. No. We all had to make it up. Every every government made mistakes because nobody really knew how this thing worked. And then science came and rescued us no. in, uh, by creating vaccines in record time. But, you know... Uh, we, we don't know, and we have to be we have to be more resilient, and we have to figure out ways to build that in. Uh, and I don't think 
I, I don't think we ma making everything at home is not going to be the answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but being less reliant on um, shipping and things like that. Well, um, as Nicolas Bar has well illustrated this morning, uh, another issue is the concern about pensions. Uh, the pensions are one of the biggest uh, ongoing challenges faced by policymakers. And matching pensions to society's needs is an impressive challenge. How do you think it can be addressed? Well, you know, I think the model that most countries are moving toward is a first layer, mm -hmm. a, a government-provided um, social security type system that applies to everybody and does a decent job of replacing income mm -hmm. for, say, the bottom third of the income distribution and uh, then helping people supplement that. Mm -hmm. And it's the middle class that needs the most help. The affluent just don't have time to spend it all, and mm -hmm. so they're going to be okay. Um, but the, the people in the middle for whom the government-provided pension isn't enough to live on, how do we help them both in accumulation and decumulation? Yeah. And uh, as somebody mentioned this morning, spending money to make uh, private savings tax-free is probably a big waste of money. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, the best paper on this uh, that I know of is one that... Uh, Raj Chetty and his team did, wrote in using uh, Danish data. Hmm. Scandinavia has become a very popular place for economists to write papers because <laughs> they don't seem to care much about privacy, so that's great for us. Um, but uh, what his team was able to do is say, if you go from a company with a low pension to a high pension, um, what happens to the rest of your balance sheet? And many economists said, look, yeah, you guys, you can get them saving more over here, but maybe they'll just run up their credit cards or save less somewhere else. And what they found in that paper is essentially no offset. Yeah. If you get people saving 12% instead of 8%, the, the 4% doesn't come. It reduces consumption yeah, and doesn't increase debt. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we know that part works, and we're getting better automatic enrollment and automatic escalation and well-defined, created default investment mm -hmm. strategies, mm -hmm that include uh, rebalancing over the lifetime. I think, you know, I would give our current system of creating private savings uh, kind of a B, B plus, you know, we're, we're F on decumulation. Hmm. And, uh, and, and I think we're not doing a great job at all of figuring out mm -hmm. how to help uh, the post-65 community um, have a better life and contribute more. Uh, you know, I'm well past 65. <laughs> Supposedly, I'm still working. Yeah. And why am I working? Because I want to keep my brain functioning. Oops. Oops. So, you know, I think it's important that pe people can keep working. Yeah. And, um, and w one way, I think, for the economy to be, become more resilient is to, for it to become more flexible. So one thing COVID taught us is in many jobs, it's not a, 
necessary for everybody to come to the office at the same time in the same place. Uh, I think society has been quite ineffective at fully employing women, especially young mothers. And, uh, and there are many highly educated, highly talented young mothers that just don't work because the economy doesn't make it sufficiently easy and rewarding. And um, that, that's a huge market failure. You know, we economists talk about market failures. But there's not enough talk about that. Mm. And I think something is similar is happening with people over 65. Okay, they go and retire. Mm. Well, then what? Mm. And I think there are many ways that um, people who are done with their regular career can be useful, usefully contributing to society and to the economy and um, keep themselves involved. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have been for two weeks, I think, in, in London yeah. recently. Uh, it was exciting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, I know two I know. prime ministers. So thank well, you very much again for coming <laughs> after that experience. Uh, but we have recently experienced there a very relevant episode in the UK pension funds uh, following the announcements by Liz Truss. He, she was the prime minister who lost her bet against Alexis. Yeah. Uh, the, the Bank of, of England has had to intervene to save the pension funds. What are your views on that? Yeah, so I don't know how, I'll try not to be too wonky about this. Um, pension, pension funds in the UK, many of them adopted a strategy that on the surface seems very appealing. Uh, it, it has, it's called liability duration matching or something like that. And the idea is we know there's this group of people that is going to retire in 27 years. So we buy a 27 year bond that will mature and uh, okay, risk goes away. And theoretically that's true. Hmm. If, if you bought the bond that expires in 27 years and it was exactly equal to the liability, which means it probably would have to be indexed, but Never mind. Let's suppose the, the liability was nominal. Th that would have some appeal. But it, in the past decade, until this year, interest rates were very low. So that was a very costly way of supporting a pension. So... They did that, but then they tried to increase returns uh, in other ways with derivatives, and that added risk. And then when interest rates went up, of course, as we all know, when interest rates go up, bond prices go down, and so they're holding all these 27-year bonds that are hardly ever trade because there's not that much of a market and bonds that will expire exactly in 27 and 26 and 25 <laughs> years. And uh, meanwhile, their brokers are calling and saying that your side bets, this is very much like the scene Selena Gomez and I had in the movies. It's the, <laughs> the derivatives are getting them in trouble and uh, there was a risk that these pension funds would just blow up because they didn't have the liquidity for their side bets. And so what the Bank of England had to do was stop their process of selling back the bonds they had accumulated during quantitative tightening and do the opposite, which made them look foolish. Um, but 
I think, I think they were heroes here. Um, and pretty quickly things got resolved. But the underlying problem is yeah. still there. Yeah. And we still have a lot of money invested that way <clears throat> with the illusion that it's risk-free and it's not. And anytime people, it's kind of the, the big risk of having a low interest rate environment is people go out looking for hmm. other ways of getting high returns and mortgage-backed securities yeah. was the one that the movie was about. And uh, yeah. fortunately, we won't have to have a movie about uh, okay. about what happened in the okay. UK. Well, at least not on the financial side. Uh, what's going on in number 10 uh, okay. might make yeah. a pretty we, good movie. We can call it Scorsese to, yeah. to film yeah, yeah. this movie. <laughs> well, following on the field of finance, a, a famous article of yours uh, with Bernard de Bon formalizes in a certain way the criticism of the classical model of finance. You explain the overreactions of markets from a psychological perspective. Your debate with Eugene Fama was, uh, on, on market anomalies was great, uh, but in, in, in which direction do you think finance theory is moving, is moving at, at present? Well, I've, I think formal mo asset pricing models hmm. are, let's say, in a state of flux. The, You know, when I went to the University of Chicago in 1995, the efficient market hypothesis was still yeah. taught as gospel. And, you know, we've had various, we had the tech bubble, we had the real estate bubble, uh, and none, neither of those is well explained by traditional asset pricing models. And if anything, I mentioned that finance is getting funnier. Um, part of the humor is being provided by retail investors. So shortly after COVID, uh, some uh, app-based investment companies, most notably Robinhood in the U.S., very cleverly named, um, created an environment for people to trade that was kind of like playing video games. Mm -hmm. And it was at a time in the spring of 2020 when there's no football or baseball or basketball to watch. There's nothing to bet on. So people start betting on stocks. And as we know, there are these mean stocks, mean stocks. Uh, came around. Uh, GameStop is one of them, a company that sells video games in dilapidated stores and old malls. It's, but, uh, and the hedge funds thought these companies were worthless and the retail investors thought they were great and there have been exciting battles. The retail investors call themselves apes, mm -hmm. uh, which is some reference to the Planet of the Apes movies that, that I don't quite get, but maybe the funniest story of all of them is going on right now. One of the meme stocks is AMC. Hmm. Uh, and AMC owns movie theaters. So they have thousands of movie theaters around the world that were empty. Hmm. And people haven't really gone back to going to movie theaters. And Wall Street thought this company should have been bankrupt. But the apes liked it and started driving the price up into the hundreds. And they got a very clever CEO who said, okay, if people are willing to pay $200 for my 
worthless company. <laughs> uh, I'll sell more shares. So he starts selling more, more and more shares and paying off debt. Brilliant. I think he also bought a gold mine. Possibly not as brilliant, but then he ran into a limit that he was only allowed in the charter of his company to have a certain number of shares. I don't remember, 500 million or something like that. Doesn't matter. Anyway, he was stuck. His main business of selling more shares of his company was cut off. What is he going to do? He suddenly comes up with a brainstorm which is to issue a new class of stock, supposedly preferred shares, though these shares are identical in every possible way. Except he calls them preferred and gives them a new ticker symbol. What does he choose? A P E ape. <laughs> now, Okay, you can take a guess. Do the, you know, the official market hypothesis says we have two identical shares. They have to trade for the same thing. We have one that's got, that has the love of the apes, mm -hmm. which is AMC. The other one is named for the apes. Well, I would have gotten this wrong. AMC goes up, APE goes down, and AMC now is selling for three times as much as APE. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you tried the arbitrage trade of selling short the expensive one and buying, going long the cheap one, then you've been losing money every day for the last two months, and you've been getting a lot of friendly calls from your broker. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, yeah, financial markets have gotten yeah. more amusing, yeah. but uh, certainly harder to understand yes. and impossible to understand yeah. in the context of the efficient market hypothesis. Yeah, of course. There's, there's no classical model that can explain that. Uh, I mean, the law of one price, if you study finance in graduate school, it starts with the law of one price, meaning the same thing, identical things have to sell for the same price. Hmm. A 10 euro note and a 20 euro, euro note have to sell at a ratio of two. And of course, arbitrage is why that will be true, hmm. because... 20 euro notes start selling for 21, then I'm going to buy a lot, a lot of 10 year, five year, 10 euro notes and go buy. So um, uh, the law of one price, if that doesn't hold, we kind of don't know anything. Yeah. And maybe it's difficult to fight with a broker called Robin Hood. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he runs around in the forest and. <laughs> I don't know whether they take from the rich and give to the poor. We, that part is <laughs> uncertain. Okay. Well, let's move on to an absolutely differential contribution of yours. Although many people know about your book, Natch, could you explain the power of Natchez in the decision-making process? Yeah, so, you know, we almost called our book Everything Matters. And because... If you're dealing a, with a world of humans, then almost anything can influence their decisions. And not just the things that get incorporated into economic models. So, you know, it started really, that book started with me giving a paper at the University of Chicago about Save More Tomorrow that you mentioned before, which is an idea one of my students and I created, which was maybe we could get people to increase their saving rates by having them sign up to not save more right now, but save more 
later because we all have more self-control later. Like I'm going to have a lot of self-control when I get home from Spain, not while I'm here. So um, I presented a paper showing that we had tripled saving rates in the first company that we got to do this. And this was at an ap academic conference where there are formal discussants. And I had a discussant from the University of Chicago who was kind of angry about this paper and said, well, yeah, it seems to work, but <laughs> isn't it paternalism? And, you know, at the University of Chicago, that is the biggest insult. I mean, if you say, oh, you're a paternalist, Communist might be worse, but it is, you know, about equal. So I said, look, I don't see why you're calling this paternalism because it's opt-in, right? We offer this to people, they can choose. There's no coercion. So normally we think of paternalism as coercive. You must wear your seatbelt uh, or you get a ticket. That's paternalism. Hmm. So... Uh, I said, I don't know if it's paternalism. Maybe, maybe we have to. It's a different kind of paternalism. I don't know. Maybe we could call it libertarian paternalism. <laughs> that really made him mad. <laughs> so the next day, I was having lunch with my friend and law professor Cass Sunstein, and uh, we had a weekly lunch. And I said, Cass, you know, I came up with a phrase yesterday that people found really annoying. Maybe we should write about it. <laughs> and um, so that was the idea. What are the things we can do that don't force anybody to do anything, mm -hmm. but help them? A, a good example, as you mentioned, I was in London for two weeks. As you know, if you've been to London, they drive on the wrong side of the road. This is just, you know, indisputable. They're stubborn over there. So everyone else drives on the right, they drive on the left, you know. Uh, but as a pedestrian, cars come the unexpected way, right? It's dangerous. And they have for a long time, and this has saved my life many times, as you, you know, in yeah. busy pedestrian areas, <laughs> there's on the street in front of you, look left, <laughs> you know, look right. And uh, that's a nudge, okay? Yeah. And it's, it's attracting your attention and helping you, but no one's forcing you to look down. You can look whichever way you want. In fact, I, when I'm in central London, I just look both ways every, like six times. Um, and that, that's my self-protection. So, um, you know, I think what we've tried to do is create a whole set of tools yeah. that people can use to help people make better decisions without forcing them to do things. And mm -hmm. automatic enrollment into yeah. pension plans that Adair Turner used in creating Nest yeah. uh, and has spread around the world, that's the most successful application of yes. the basic idea. Yes, yes. And do you help them, uh, David no, Halpern? I, not really. Was... I mean, I think he had come across the idea. I had one conversation with him in London once, but he was down that path. I can't claim credit for that one. They did uh, adopt the automatic escalation. Let's yeah. save more tomorrow. Sure, uh, sure I'm they. sure they were influenced by our work. And Richard, <coughs> there have been some debates lately about whether nudges actually work. I know you have been following them. What are your views on that? Yeah, <laughs> how many hours? <laughs> uh, Next question? <laughs> yeah. No, I think, so there's, there's a technique in science called meta-analysis, and 
Roughly speaking, what you do is you do a big search of all papers of a certain category. In this case, it's all papers that have the word nudge somewhere in the paper and that ran a randomized control trial. And then you calculate a measure of effect size, which is uh, something called Cohen's D. Uh, it's the difference in the treatment groups divided by standard deviation. And then in this first paper, they calculated the average of these. And then there's a second paper that says, if you correct for something called publication bias, then, the, so I, in the first paper, the average effect size was small but significant. The second one, when you make this correction, it's zero. And the second one has the title something like, nudges have no effect. Mm -hmm. Now, we know automatic enrollment, automatic escalation has created hundreds of billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. It's not true that it has no effect. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's an interesting story. Yeah. There's a German scientist in, in the 1930s. He was trying to find a treatment for infection. This is pre-penicillin. Mm -hmm. And he was working at Bayer, the aspirin company. And he had two chemists. They were, they were making dyes. And they had an idea that you could use dyes to treat infection. So the chemists would come up with dye number one. He, he took a dozen rats and made them sick, gave half of them dye number one, looked to see the next morning they're all dead. Okay, scratch that off. Mm -hmm. Dye number 872, all the rats are alive. Sorry, Sorry I said cereal. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's telling us we're done. So this story is about wants done. To participate. Um, so die 800 and something saves all the rats. Turns out it saves millions of lives, including the life of Winston Churchill. It created the drug that he calls sulfa, which was the only real way to treat infection until antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So the average effect size of that guy's lab was 0 0.000. But there was one good one. And I don't, I don't think that the average effect size is what we ought to do. Let me just say one more thing, because mm -hmm. it, I think it's important. This publication bias I don't think is very important. People publish bigger effects, and I think that's because they're more interesting. There's something that I think is more important that I call permission bias. Mm -hmm. If I have some idea that would help in some domain, mm -hmm. well, I have to get permission to do it. So I had an idea four years ago that a way to get people to take their flu shots mm -hmm. might be, if they show up on time, to give them a lottery ticket. Say, if you come, we're going to give you a lottery ticket. It's worth $3. Well, we couldn't get permission to run that experiment. Four years later, COVID is happening. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get people to take the vaccine. And Katie Milkman, a behavioral economist at Wharton, says, oh, maybe we should try your old lottery idea that we had never been able to test. So somebody gave us half a million dollars to try this idea, but it takes a long time to get permission. And we never could get permission to run it the way I had designed it, which was you show up to get your shot, you get a lottery ticket. I said, no, that's not fair to all the people that have already gotten vaccinated. So we ended up running an experiment 
A week before it was launched, the governor of Ohio announces five million dollar lotteries. It's a neighboring state. We ran our experiment, it has exactly no effect. <laughs> Does that tell us my old idea doesn't work? We don't know. No. It might be a bad idea, it might be a good idea. Until we get permission to run the experiment, we'll never know. We'll never know. Okay. Uh, Kessan, you introduced the concept of a sludge as well. And you also said that the battle against climate change is not won with nudges, uh, but be by m making people pay for polluting. So would it be correct to say that this is an example of sludge? Um, no, I, um, no, I don't think so. Um, so I think on... On climate change, there's, this is something every economist in the world agrees about, that we are not going to make progress until we set the prices right. And frankly, the biggest changes for climate change are going to have to be at the industrial level. Hmm. How, how it's, yes, we can do our share, but it's how we generate power, how we move things around. That's, and... Companies respond to prices. Sweden has a price of $100, $100 per ton of carbon emissions. And if you noticed, if you've been to Stockholm, it's a very nice city. The economy is thriving. You can have a good economy with a carbon tax. Sludge is just really the opposite of nudge. It's, you know, nudges make it easy. Sludge is stuff that gums up the works. We were talking at lunch about hmm. the difficulties of getting benefits that people are entitled to, to them because they have to fill out some form hmm. and the government has to make sure that they're entitled to it. That's sludge. Yeah. And so I think we can accomplish a lot by just Getting rid of sludge, meaning get figuring out more efficient ways mm -hmm. of accomplishing our goals. And um, that's uh, my friend Cass was back working in government yeah. the last couple of years and was trying to reduce the sludge in the American immigration system. But it's a big job. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we, we are uh, uh, reaching the end of this conversation. But regarding immigration, let me uh, um, ask the, the following. You have spoken out in favor of legal immigration as a source of, of increased world growth. However, the immigration issue uh, is uh, one of these we call inspired perceptions uh, in the sense of immigrants are coming to take our jobs, uh, to use our health care system, or even to get our social benefits. Can behavioral economics give messages to help us understand that immigration can, in fact, be positive? Well, I wish I had, like, a, <laughs> you know, a line as good as... Uh, take back control, uh, which was probably the most brilliant and evil nudge of all time. If, if you don't know, that was the motto of the Brexit campaign. Yes. But um, look, what, what I think is a country like Spain, yeah. uh, with, we've seen the graphs, yeah. the population is getting older and uh, you younger people are not having enough babies. And so uh, the social security system, something has to give. Yeah. We have no choice. You have to either cut benefits or raise taxes or increase the retirement age or some combination or have more babies. <laughs> or have more immigration and especially immigrants who are interested in having babies. So I think there may be 
a more skillful, I'm sure Barack Obama could phrase this uh, better than I could, but, you know, it's, it, it's true that people all over Europe systematically overestimate by a factor of five to ten the number of immigrants in their country. Hmm. So it's a problem that obviously there's xenophobia involved as well and and all kinds of fears, but um, in in countries like the U.S. where we have two job openings for every unemployed person and in countries like Spain that uh, having have an aging population, um, we need to move people from places where they can't work uh, to places where they can, and that's going to make everybody better off. Okay. Dear Professor Thaler, it has been a real pleasure chatting with you today. I hope your stay in, your stay in Spain uh, will be a memorable one, uh, and we really hope that you come back again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.